season high in points for a team. Just your thoughts on the tempo you all played with tonight. Yeah, we started off a little bit slow, um, but we were playing together, playing unselfish, and playing fast for pretty much the whole game. Um, I think that's why we saw the score jump up like that. Josh, another triple-double for you here in the Garden this afternoon. Just your thoughts on the way that you are able to attack on all three levels. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, sparks with our defense. I mean, we started on slow on that end. We allowed, I think, 48 in the first quarter. So when we were good on that end, we got out and run, played in transition. Um, things opened up for everybody. So, um, you know, it's a fun group of guys to play with. It's unselfish, so um, good win today. How about the show this guy put on? Man, it's fun to be a part of. I mean, um, you know, there's no better place to do it in the Garden. So, um, you know, it's great playing with him. I think our chemistry is going to continue to grow. Um, and hopefully we can be a hell of a backhaul for a long time. The monster tall timber inside. For as long as I can remember, I've watched, read, or even just heard of dynamic duos coming together to get the job done. Duos are what we sort of grew up on, basketball or not. You want fictional duos? There's Batman and Robin, Mario and Luigi, SpongeBob and Patrick. You want food duos? Burgers and fries, bacon and eggs, pineapple on pizza? No. But on the basketball side of things, we have backcourt duos in the NBA like Steph and Clay, Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. We have a duo on the wings like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. But this is a very unique duo that I'm not sure we have anywhere else in the NBA. A tall duo that shares the backcourt with great passing ability. And yes, Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland are great scorers with high level passing ability, but they're both listed at 6'1". Josh Giddy at 6'8", and Shea at 6'6", six six, makes them a very sizable backcourt that can see everything happening on the floor with less difficulty. Giddy and Shea are both ranked in the top 30 in assists per game, and depending on who you ask, some might think of that as underwhelming, but when you actually watch OKC play, the hockey assists that these two are constantly responsible for are what makes this team run. A roster is obviously going to put a ceiling on what a team can ultimately do, but it's what Giddy and Shea are able to do night in and night out for this team that makes it all impressive to me. And I get it, it's Oklahoma City. It's not a team that gets nationally televised games, so you basically need NBA League Pass or their local channel to watch them. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this duo, just watch these quick clips between Shea and Giddy making things happen. Shea's obviously been having a breakout season, putting more of a spotlight on OKC, and truly the biggest reason this team is winning as many games as it has so far. Shea also has an element to his game that's crucial to winning. Now for those that say the mid-range game is dead, keep your hopes up by watching Shea play. This dude is a mid-range beast, from step backs to snatch backs, turnaround jumpers to stop and pops, Shea's bag in the mid-range has never looked better. And it's really opened up OKC's ability to score when the game slows down. But Shea's always watching the attention he draws and quickly finds teammates for easy baskets. Josh Giddy approaches the game in a unique way, but his struggles as a shooter was what first made me question the fit with Shea being out there at the same time. And that's quickly turned around for me because of both Giddy's improvements as an outside shooter and Shea's developing shot creation. So much can happen for a team if spacing exists. And while Josh Giddy still isn't a true threat from three, he's definitely improved from last year. He's currently at 32%, which is still below league average, but much more respectable than his 26% last year. To me, 
Once Giddy can stay solid at 35% from three, he will reach his all-star potential because it's gonna open up the strongest part of his game, which is his playmaking. So what once looked to be a clunky offense with poor spacing has really come a long way for OKC as a whole. But looking at what they have here, they have Lou Dort, strong and pesky defender that not only does the dirty work, but also scores and plays aggressively. They have a second duo in Jalen Williams and Jalen Williams, one being J-Dub and the other going by J-Will. The guard Jalen Williams is a freak athlete that gets downhill with good ball control and also makes great passes. Center Jay Will is more of a traditional post center that's slowly working on shooting, but he has good vision and he doesn't play outside of himself, which is important. Then you have Pokushevsky, who's been injured but showed great flashes of shooting confidently and improving his efficiency, another interesting prospect on that team. But then you have Chet Holmgren, who was unfortunately injured, but also someone we can't forget about despite what his non-believers say. This is a 7-footer that's an elite shot blocker, he's also a great rebounder, an elite 3-point shooter in college, along with a solid mid-range game, and really good handles for his height. Strength remains his weakness, but in a modern NBA, with spacing and tons of foul calls, I think Chet will be fine. And while this roster isn't going to hold up against most of the league, Giddy and Shea get the most out of their teammates by making sure everyone's involved. So much so that they're basically playing close to 500 basketball, something that as you can see here, hasn't been true for the teams with higher expectations below them. Now as bright as the future looks for OKC, it doesn't come without questions from a lot of people. One of the bigger questions being, how long will the draft be something to look forward to? And when will the focus to win now take its course? Sam Presti and the rest of OKC's front office have unquestionably been a poster child of drafting and scouting well. We're always reminded of Westbrook, KD, and Harden all being future Hall of Famers and MVPs they drafted. But fast forward to where they are today. Trading away Paul George to the Clippers for a ton of picks and Shea Gilgis Alexander, a move that hasn't had championship effects for either team, but has created some hope for OKC's future. But from stockpiling picks to preaching patience and everything else that comes with maintaining hopes for future success, how much time will pass before we start to question their ability to get over the top? All that being said, OKC's been a fun league pass team to watch, and I'm hoping to see big strides as time passes by. Thanks for watching this quick video. This is the All Things Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Vic Lopez, as always, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thank you.